Welcome back. So, this is part two of divine healing we're going to talk about. And today, I wanted to tell you some of the testimonies uh, of the healings that I have experienced in my journey in discovering divine healing. Now, a lot of churches believe that healing passed with the apostles, but I'm here to tell you, not the case. Not the case. Uh, I don't care what your pastor tells you. They're not God. They don't get to make the rules. God has set aside, if you watch part one, you know that God has set aside provisions for this at great expense to himself, and he wants people healed. So, and as I mentioned the first one, I spent about three years really delving into this, consuming everything I could get a hold of, every teaching. I wanted to know, you know, specifically every teaching from people that were getting results. You can read books on healing all day long, but is that person getting results? That's what I want to know. And also, it seemed like prior to that, if there was a healing going on or something amazing, it was taking place in some faraway country. As I started to really get into learning about it, I realized, no, it's happening here. It's just, you're just not hearing about it. So, three years, I really, I really was getting into it, and, and I was telling God, you know, okay, I was trying to work up the faith, because this was, I'm a little introverted, and going up to people and going, hey, I want to pray for you, you know, that was, that was, it was awkward for me. But I was like, I had told God, man, I, the first one has got to be big, God. It's got to be big. I don't want to pray for somebody for a headache or a toothache, something I can't substantiate. Lord, I was just, I, I need something big and significant that I could go, it, it worked. It worked. I did it, and it worked. You know, or the Holy Ghost did it, but he used my hands, and it worked. And so there was a gal, I don't want to give her name, but she had been going to the church her and her husband had been going to uh, this Bible study that I, we had been going to, and, and I, I was doing worship at this Bible study. And she was suffering from fibromyalgia, uh, which is really a catch-all term for debilitating body pain. And so she was, she was taking narcotic painkillers and, and doing a lot of other stuff. In fact, she was, in truth, she was addicted to the painkillers. Just I, I've had some debilitating pain in my life, and there you get to a point where everything in your life is just about the remediation of that pain. In my case, it was some back pain. I'd injured my back. And, and you despair of life. So I will not begrudge her getting addicted to painkillers because I know how bad it can get. And so she was getting a little discouraged because nobody either, either wanted to pray for her or, or really had any success. And so I said, hey, you know, I really would like to pray for you. Do you mind if I come over to your house? And, and her husband, yeah, yeah. She, they was to, she was totally desirous of prayer. So that was, that was nice. So I went over there, and I, because I was a worship leader, uh, I brought my guitar. Now, you don't have to do this, but this is just how I, I did it. In fact, almost nobody else does it the way I do it. So, um, and because she was kind of like a worship leader, she's a singer, uh, and in fact, I think even today she's a professional musician somewhere. So I got out the guitar and I said, "Hey, let's let's just let's do some worship for a little bit." And we did some worship for a little bit, and and um, and then I kind of talked to them a little bit about what I had been learning about healing, and just what I would share to you that God wants you healed. God made provision for it. By His stripes we were healed. That whole thing, and and these signs shall follow them that believe. All of that stuff, and. And they were believers, and they were like, yes, yes, yes. So I said, all right, Holy Ghost, this is it. You know, pain, you go in Jesus' name. And I just started, you know, commanding that pain to leave, that inflammation to leave, uh, all that stuff. At some point, and I, again, I'm not going to sit there for half an hour. I, one, I'm just not that patient. You know, I, I'm not that guy. <laughs> just like, I'm gonna, it's a couple minutes of, you know, telling it what's up and get, get out of her body. And I was like, okay, do you feel any different, you know? Uh, one of the things that, that uh, JGM will tell you is have them do what they couldn't do before. And so she's like, okay, yeah, I feel, I do feel different. And so she went over and she liked, she had candles everywhere. Like a lot of women like candles. My wife loves candles. And she went and got this little skinny lighter, little tube lighter. And she put her hand around it and she lit it. And she's like, I couldn't do that. It hurt too much to wrap my fingers tight around this skinny little it was like smaller than a Bic, about half the size of a, like a normal Bic lighter. And so she was like, oh my God, I can do it. And she went around and lit some candles and she was totally excited. I was blown away, blown away. Cause that was, she was free and free to this day 
of fibromyalgia. So that was the first one. I was really excited. The, the very next person, and again, I, I, when people have headaches, I'll pray for them, but I like to see, I like to see change. That was, I, I won't refuse praying for anybody, but I really enjoy seeing life change. And there was another guy whose name I wouldn't tell you if I knew it, but I can't remember his name anyway. But he had come, he had come to the, uh, the fellowship and he was having what he thought was Lyme's disease at the time. Again, it was, it's like a nondescript pain, anxiety, kind of achy all over, chronic fatigue kind of stuff. That night, we, we just kind of did a group prayer for him, did a thing. Weeks later, maybe even a month later, I, I called to check up on him, just say, hey, how you feeling, you know? And he had gotten significantly worse. In fact, he hadn't worked for a long time. He couldn't keep food down. Uh, he was doing bad. And so I was like, hey, you know, can I, can I come over and pray with you? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, back then I didn't know, I didn't have a method or anything like that. I knew I was going to bring my guitar. And I said, you know what else? I'm going to take the first gal and bring her along because she knows firsthand that God heals. If nothing else, she could be an encouragement to him because I wasn't sure, you know, where he was mentally. And again, it, it doesn't really matter, but I wanted as many things in a positive direction lined up that I could. When we got there, I was stunned because he was a pretty good sized guy. He's a little bit taller than me. I'm six foot, so he was probably six two. Athletic build. I forget what he did for a living, but it was something physical, maybe construction or something like that. But he was a fit guy, big guy, muscular guy. He looked like an Auschwitz survivor when we got there. He had lost so much weight. It probably didn't help that he had like Look, what looked like prison pajamas on. You know, he was in his pajamas and he just was like hunched over. His face was hollow and gone. He looked terrible. And I was like, holy cow, you know. Um, talking to him, he couldn't keep food down now. He was, you know, it was, it just, he hadn't been eating, so he's losing weight and he was just in pain all the time. And I was like, dang. And so we went inside again. I, we, you know, they're believers. So we, I got out the guitar. We did some songs. I kind of talked about God's will, again, just like I did with the, the first gal. She was there. She shared her testimony. God healed him. And they were like, oh, great. So we prayed for him and didn't, you know, didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. You know, he thought, well, maybe I feel a little better. It was tough to tell, you know, because it wasn't like, a, you know, like, oh, my thumb is broken and now it's better. It was, it was just, the way I could put it, it was like he was slowly dying. That, that is really what looked, it was up. And so, you know, I, I was a little discouraged that he didn't just spring up. Like, I feel heat running through my body and all of a sudden, and, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but that would have been awesome. That didn't happen. So we, we got ready to leave and I told him, you know, don't be surprised if it gets worse before it gets better. And that is something that I tell a lot of people, if, if they're not immediately healed, it might get a little worse. In the Bible, Jesus was praying for uh, a child one time and he commanded the demon to come out and the demon threw that boy down and rolled around before it came out. It was kind of roughing the kid up a little bit before it left. And the way that I, the analogy that I kind of give people is, it's like these demons are squatting in a building and you show up with the cop and say, you guys got to get out. You got, you know, half an hour. And they're pissed and they're coming over here and they're like kicking holes in the walls and punching holes in the walls and breaking pipes and just doing damage on the way out. And they know they have to leave. They're pissed about it. And so they're just kind of wrecking things on the way out like yeah we're gonna show you and so I told him sometimes that happens it might get worse don't get discouraged that's actually a good sign because they know they gotta go and sickness has gotta leave whether it's demonic or whatever and they gotta go and so we left gave it a couple days and maybe a week and I called him back and just you know hey how you doing and he's like I feel great and he told me that the next day he felt worse. In fact, he was thinking of going to the emergency room. And he said, I remembered what you said. I just gave it. I said, I'm going to wait till a little bit later in the afternoon. He goes, as the day progressed, I felt better and better and better and better and better. And he goes, by that, by that afternoon, late afternoon, I was able to eat something and keep it down. The next day, that night I ate food. The next day I had breakfast. And he goes, I've been able to eat every day. And I just, he got better and stronger and stronger and eventually gained all his weight back and went back to work. And so I was, I was stoked. One other time, a buddy of mine, Gary and I, we got a call to go pray for a family friend of his who was hanging Christmas lights up on a ladder 
and the ladder fell out from underneath him and he like he grabbed that gutter and his and his body body swang and he fell and landed on his head and he was he was in the hospital that's all we knew and so uh gary called me up and said hey can can you come pray over him with me and i'm like i'm yeah i'm there let's do it and he said oh that's great um because God told me you were going to come. And I was like, I'm always going to come if I can make it. So, you know, we didn't know. And this is a little principle that I'll, I'll share with you guys. An encourager. We weren't family. He was in critical condition. And sometimes they won't let you in. And so we were discussing that. And I said, you know what? If, if, if this is God, if God's setting this up, we'll get there. They'll let us in. And then that'll be a sign. Like that gate is open. And so I often tell people that in, in healing, the point I'm getting at is the healing doesn't always manifest instantly. When it does, that's outstanding. But sometimes it takes a, a period of time, like in the case of the gentleman who was wasting away. It, it, that happened over a week or so. Like he got better and better and better and better. And so as the people that are scared, I said, just take the first step and come to the barrier. And if the barrier opens up or moves, take the next step. And keep going and keep going. And so that's why I told Gary, I said, oh, this is, you know, we'll just go as far as we can go. If, if they say, come, you know, hey, we get into the ICU, great. If we get into his room, then that's a, just a sign that God is with us and we're there for the very reason that we're there for. You know, we're going we're gonna to heal this guy. It's like, okay. So we get there and, uh, you know, he, he feels like God told him that him and I were going to go in there and pray. And I'm like, okay. But I had a flight to catch. And the family was in there, and it, and it turns out he was not doing well. He was unresponsive for quite a while. He was on life support, and basically the whole family was there to like say their goodbyes and decide at what point they're going to pull the plug. So it, he wasn't doing good at all. Body wasn't working. He was on like a breathing machine, and they were, just, they were keeping him alive. And everybody was saying their goodbyes, and the discussion was, when do we pull the plug? Should we pull the plug? And so we're like, oh, man, you know, are we too late? You know, is, he's in a vegetable state, and we don't you know, what to do. And, then, and so they said, well, right now, you can't go in. And, and I was telling Gary, well, you know, I got, like, a little bit of time, but I got to catch this flight. So it looked like I wasn't going to be able to stick around. So, I, so my plan was I was going to transfer whatever faith I had to Gary for this particular healing. And <laughs> Gary was nervous. He was like, Oh man, okay. I don't, you know, he wanted me in there with him just, you know, for support and stuff like that. So I said, all right, come here, let's, let's do this. Cause I got to get going. And then they said, oh, they came out and they go, oh, you know what? Um, okay. You guys can come in yet. And so I didn't know, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, what a guy that landed on his head had been in a vegetative state. I figured kind of close to death looking. So in other words, they're pale, they're kind of thin looking, but that's not what we saw when we walked in. So we walk in and I'm like, whoa, he was swollen like a drowning victim that had been floating in the water for a couple days. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but that it was the opposite of what I expected to see. I mean, his, his hands were swelled up, his eyes, his eyes, face, his belly, everything was bloated. He was just bloated laying there in bed. I don't know why, but it was, it was weird. You know, and everybody, the family that was in there, it just, it was kind of awkward. Again, I'm an introvert. I don't like to make a scene, but, you know, so Gary and I just, we, we laid hands on him and prayed and we didn't see anything. So, but I had a plane to catch, so we bounced. And I said, well, keep me posted on how he does. And sure enough, he woke up sometime after that, uh, shortly after that. And so I called Gary to see, just see how he's doing. And he said, uh, and the Lord had been talking to me, you know, I've been praying about, in between that initial prayer and when I called Gary, I've been praying about it. And one of the things the Lord told me was his lungs need to begin working. And I said, okay. And so I, in Jesus' name, I commanded his lungs to start working. And so I called Gary. And I just, you know, thought that was insight the Holy Ghost was giving me. And so I called Gary to see how he's doing. He goes, you know what? He woke up. But they've, they've uh, and I think I shared with him first. I said, you know what? Uh, before I called you, I was, the Holy Ghost told me his lungs need to start working. So I, I you know, addressed that issue. And he goes, no way. That is exactly what my mom just told me in the update is like, he's awake, but his lungs aren't working. And so suffice it to say, his lungs started working. Eventually he was completely restored. And not too long ago, Gary came to me one day and he goes, Hey, guess what? I went golfing. Guess who I was golfing with? You, you remember that guy that we, you know, was in, he knows his name. I don't remember his name, but 
He goes, I'm out there golfing that dude. And it was just a trip. Remember, you know, cause he was dead and, or looked dead and he was pretty close. So that was another cool one. That was another cool one. So I want to share a couple now that, that I wasn't personally at hand with, uh, but I think are cool nonetheless. So I mentioned John G. Lake Ministries and the, the head director, I'm not, I think that's his title, head overseer, that's what it is. Curry Blake um, has three kids. He had four. One passed away when he was much, much younger. Um, but his next youngest one was playing in an upstairs room, second floor room, and doing something and was pressed up against the screen and the screen popped out and she fell, landed on her face, dead. Uh, knocked her teeth in and she was dead. And, you know, he was in another room downstairs doing whatever he's doing and, you know, he heard the poof and he kind of went outside to see what the heck that was and found his, his little girl dead. And she was, I want to say around three. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but you know, he just, he kind of propped her up and, you know, her head's lolled to the side. And like I said, her teeth were gone, missing. And, and what do you do? And he, you know, he had, by his own admission, he wasn't ready for this. And he just, you know, you will live and not die. You will live and not die. In Jesus' name, you will live and not die. And he just, he kept at that until she started to cough. <coughs> and she came back to life, coughed up some blood and, and they got her some food to eat. Because for some reason, when people are dead and they come back, um, there's some theory. He had a pretty interesting theory on that. But uh, he gives them food to eat. That, there was another one in the Bible where Jesus brought somebody back to life, and he said, hey, bring them some bread. That, that the chewing motion helps solidify your spirit back to your body. kind of kind of helps remember, okay, yeah, this is where I need to be here. Uh, or maybe they're just generally hungry. I don't know. But that's, that's what he did. And his daughter is alive and well today. And another one that I think is really cool is um, there was a friend also from that same ministry. His name is Adam, and he was Australian. Um, was in Australia at a campsite somewhere in Australia. I don't remember. But everybody's in their tents, and there's a, it's a rainy night, stormy night. Wind's blowing. It's raining. kind of sucks to be in a tent, but that's, that's what they were doing. And in the middle of the night, a massive eucalyptus tree fell over and it crushed a tent and there was some people in it. And so they, they, you know, everybody heard it, everybody got out and they're like, oh crap, it's landed on a tent. And so they tried to chainsaw it. Eventually they did. I mean, it took hours. And because these, if you've ever seen a eucalyptus tree, they are heavy, heavier than oak. It's a dense, dense wood, super heavy. And so um, finally they had got it signed a chainsaw up and they got some trucks and stuff and chained it and and wasn't even off but they just lifted it up a little bit and Adam was able to climb in there and there was a girl and it had landed basically right on her head and just flattened it into the dirt you know we're talking thousands and thousands of pounds so she was squished flat and he was able to just kind of reach his hand in there and feel feel and he put her hand on her and just started praying you know I'm not sure exactly what he said, probably something similar to Curry since he was in that ministry. You know, you will live and not die, you will live and not die. And he said he heard cracking and, and bones cracking and stuff. And he, he said literally she started to inflate like a balloon. Just, you, know, you could just feel her like inflating like a balloon. And, and again, he heard her start to cough. And he, she came to and he helped her climb out. And... Uh, She's alive. He said she had a little bit of a headache for a little bit after that. But, I mean, to go from flat as a pancake, I mean, he literally flattened her and then pushed her into the dirt. Like, she was flat. It wasn't just, like, knocked out. She was flat. And so God inflated her. She climbed out, and she's alive today. So that is the kind of stuff that's going on, going on all the time. You can get on. If you, if you have a mind to look for it, you can find all kinds of testimonies. There's lots of stuff on YouTube you can watch. It's amazing. And if you know that God desires healing for you, for everybody, it opens doors. And that anybody can do it. Anybody that believes can do this. And it's, again, it's not you, it's the Holy Ghost. But anybody can carry the Holy Ghost where it needs to be uh, or he, where he needs to be. So I encourage you to get involved, get out there. Uh, even if your church isn't into healing, you can't be. You could be the one to spark that fire in your fellowship because you let the Holy Ghost loose. I don't take anything away from Jesus because nothing is, 
is possible without Jesus first making it possible by his pain and suffering. It's by his stripes that we were healed. So, in the next episode, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that can possibly be happening when you don't see results. So, in part three, that's what we'll talk about. Be blessed.